A while ago, my cousin asked me to replace the batteries in some of his old Game Boy and Game Boy Advance games, and that's not really a problem. These replacement batteries are pretty cheap, and the process of removing the battery and replacing it is pretty easy. The only problem is, as soon as you remove the batteries in any one of these games, I'm pretty sure that the save game just gets deleted. Now, I have a nice big pile of parts here to build a SANI cartridge reader. Now, what a cartridge reader does is it allows you to not only just dump the ROM at any one of those games, but it also lets you read and write the save game data on all those cartridges. It actually works on a whole bunch of different consoles, like the NES, the Famicom, the Super Nintendo, the N64, the Sega Genesis, the Master System, there's just a giant list here. The best part about the Sandy Cartridge Reader is that it's open source. So I'm gonna take you through all the steps on how to build one of these yourself, and that way you too can dump the ROMs, or read and write save games from all the cartridges in your collection. Before we move on, I wanna thank the sponsor of this video, PCBWay. I talk a lot about open source retro projects here on the channel, and most of these projects utilize custom PCBs, like the ones we'll see here in a second. PCBWay is a PCB manufacturer that can easily produce custom PCBs for any open source project. They provide 3D printing services as well, so if you don't have your own 3D printer, they've got you covered. They even provide CNC machining and injection molding services if you're looking to create a professional looking product. Thanks again to PCBWay. You can find out more by visiting the link in the description. I'm gonna be building version five of the Sandy Cart Reader, and I'm gonna to refer to the instructions on how to put it together from the GitHub page. The first thing that we should do is go over the list of parts that we're gonna to need to put it together. The first thing that we're gonna need is a Mega 2560 Pro, which is a little microcontroller on this little dev board thing. And we need to make sure that we get a Mega 2560 Pro that has five little surface mount components right here in a row. There are some clone versions of this that have six in a row. Those won't work with this, so you need to get this one that has five in a row. We're gonna need a few custom PCBs. This first one here is like the main PCB that a couple of other PCBs are going to solder into. This next one here is the six slot adapter that is going to allow us to connect all those different cartridges to the main PCB. There's also this optional pick adapter PCB, which I'm going to be installing in my Sandy cartridge reader. That just allows you to read SNES SA1 cartridges. We're also gonna need this MakerBase MKS Mini 12864 version three, which is a little LCD screen and a control knob. Basically, this is the control interface for our cartridge reader. We're also gonna need a bunch of different lengths of male and female pin headers. I'm gonna leave a list on the screen of the different lengths that we're going to need. We will need two of these two x five male IDC pin headers, along with two of these IDC cables. We'll also need all of the different types of cartridge slots for each of the consoles that the Sandy cartridge reader supports. We're going to need some various hardware and standoffs. Again, I'll leave a list of all these parts on the screen here. We're also gonna need a bunch of other smaller things such as an N64 controller extension cable, two of the slide switches, an SD card, a three millimeter LED, one 1K ohm and one 220 ohm through hole resistors, one 470 microfarad capacitor, some rubber feet that we're going to put on the bottom of the cart reader when we're done, and one male to female DuPont connector cable. We're going to need some extra parts for this optional SNES SA1 cartridge reader. We're going to need a PIC microcontroller, and we're going to talk about how to flash that later. And we're going to need this 100 nanofarad ceramic capacitor. And we are going to need a 3D printed piece. This is a bracket that we're going to mount the PCBs and the screen to. If you don't want to source all the parts to build a cart reader yourself, I'll leave a link in the description where you could buy a kit that contains all the pieces that you'll need. Or if you really don't want to assemble it yourself, you can also buy a fully assembled cart reader. Now we can start with the assembly portion of the cartridge reader. The guide actually has you start by flashing some firmware onto the Mega here and doing something with the screen. But I think I would rather start with soldering the main PCB here as well as the cartridge slot PCB. The first thing that we're gonna solder onto this main PCB is the Game Boy cartridge slot. So we can kind of line up the holes on the bottom of the cartridge slot here with the holes on the PCB, like that. And I'm actually going to start by soldering one of these big ground tabs in the back here. So we're just gonna add a bunch of solder to one of these ground pads here. And that's really gonna hold everything in place while we solder the pins in the front. And I'm actually gonna solder these pins first before I solder this other ground, just in case I need to rearrange things. I could do that before both of these ground tabs are soldered. We're gonna be doing a little bit of drag soldering, but I'm just gonna use my normal chisel tip. I think there's enough variety of different types of soldering that we're gonna to have to do that I'll probably want a chisel tip at some point. 
I guess you could use a knife edge tip or a J tip if you wanted to, but let's see how far I get with my normal chisel tip. And I'm gonna be using this VS213 Amtec Flux. This is going to help a lot with drag soldering the pins on this cartridge slot. I'm gonna start by just tacking down one of the pins on the opposite side of that ground pad that I already soldered. Hopefully that'll give us a little bit of stability. Now I could put a bunch of this flux down on these pins. And then we should be able to just add some solder to the end of our soldering iron and slowly make our way across. It's okay if you have bridges like this, you can take your time and spread it to the next pin if you want to, or you can just leave it for the end and clean it up with some solder braid. Well, this didn't work as well as I wanted it to. I probably should have just gone one at a time and added some solder, but let's clean up that bridge that I made earlier. I think I'm gonna add more flux as well. And let's see what happens if I heat up all the pins again. I think I'd like to add some more solder to some of these pins. Okay, that looks pretty good. I hope you can see why I really like the Amtec Flux. There's still some on the board here, even though I've been working on it for a few minutes. So that will really help you avoid bridges and you can kind of touch things up without having to worry about adding extra flux back on this while you're working on it. And before we forget, let's go ahead and solder that other ground pad. Before we move on though, let's go ahead and clean up that flux off of here. I think that's pretty much the only component that's soldered directly onto the top side of this board. So let's clean up this side so that way we don't have to worry about it after we've got other things in the way. Next, we're gonna be soldering a bunch of female pin headers. In the beginning, I had a list of all the different sizes that you're gonna need, but chances are you're probably only gonna find them in these really long lengths, and that's what I have. So I'm gonna show you how to deal with those with pretty much just some side cutters. And I guess you'll probably need some kind of pliers just to make it easy as well. Pretty much anywhere that you see a row of vias like that is going to get a pin header on the top here. So let's start replacing one of your pin headers into the far left hole of any of those rows and try to line it up as best you can. And if you look at the opposite end, you can pretty much see where the row stops. So keep an eye on the pin that is to the right of that. So in my case, there are still two extra pins that I don't need in this row. So take this strip out. We're gonna take the pliers and pull the pin out of the next pin in the line. And we could take some side cutters and kind of cut as close in the middle of that row as you can. With the metal pin removed, it actually makes it really easy just to cut this with side cutters. You can clean it up a little bit if you want. I have a little plastic file that I can use to kind of clean up that edge. Then we could put that pin header back in the row and now we can solder the pin header on. But I'm gonna kind of flip it over. I'm just gonna solder one of the pins here on the far end. Doesn't really matter which. And then I can hold the PCB up like this and heating up that pin, I can make sure that the whole row is level. Okay, with it level, I can go ahead and solder the opposite end so that the whole row is kind of tacked down. Make sure that that is level two. And now we can solder the rest of the pins in the row.
that's the first row done. Now we pretty much have to do that over and over again to these other spots here on the board. All right, I populated the rest of the female pin headers. You have to be a little bit careful down here. There is sort of an L going on, so you have to do this bottom row and then a little section with three pins each here for the top of the L. Let's move on and solder the two switches on the right side over here. So we're gonna take one of our little switches and put it like that so that the switch part is hanging off the edge of the board. It's gonna be a little bit tricky soldering these switches in because the pins on the outside edge are actually attached to the metal part of the actual switch. So I'm gonna add some solder to my soldering iron and then I'm gonna flip it over and I'm gonna solder one of the legs in the middle. Because those pins in the middle should not be connected to the actual metal shielding. So then I can kind of push that switch down, get it leveled to the board. And now I should be able to solder the pins on the outside edge. And then I can do the same thing for the other switch. Okay, now we can solder these IDC connectors in place. I forgot to mention that the little cutout here is supposed to line up with the little bump on the silk screen here. Now we can't forget about the 470 microfarad capacitor, so let's go ahead and solder that. These capacitors are polarized, meaning that there is a right and a wrong way to solder this in. The white line on the side of here, this the shorter leg, is the negative side. So that is going to match up with the white part of the silk screen on the actual PCB. So go ahead and put the capacitor in there. And then I like to spread the legs apart a little bit like that, so that it kind of holds it in place here so it doesn't fall out while you're soldering it. And then we can solder the legs on the bottom. And then we need to cut these legs short with some side cutters. There's another little hole over here, but we're gonna come back to that. So let's handle the last two pieces on the bottom here. This left piece is the LED, and the right piece is the resistor for that LED. It says here that we're gonna need a 220 ohm resistor, so we're gonna have to find which of these is the 220 ohm. I had to look up what the color bands mean, but this top one here, which goes uh, red, red, black, black, brown, at least for me, this was the 220 ohm resistor. So we're gonna take the legs and sort of pre-bend them a little bit, and then we're gonna put them into the resistor spot down here. And then we're gonna bend the legs like it did before. And then we get solder. Now we can solder in the LED. Now the guide has a pretty decent explanation of how to tell which end of this LED is which as far as negative and positive. So it says to look for the leg that has the big metal part inside of the actual LED. So that means that the right leg or the shorter leg is the side that lines up with that big metal thing in there. And that is the side that is going to go into the square hole here on the bottom. There's a square via and a circle via. The short leg is gonna go in the square side. And then we can do the same thing with the legs. There is actually one more thing I wanna do right now before I forget it, and that is on the back of this board here. If you have a revision three of the Hardware 5 PCB, then we need to set this jumper J1 here. So all we need to do is bridge those two pads with a little bit of solder. Just like that. We're making our way to being able to test the cartridge reader, but first we need to flash the firmware onto the Mega 2560 Pro. So let's head over to the computer and I'll show you how to do that. We're gonna need three things to flash the firmware onto our Mega. The first is a micro USB cable. 
The second is going to be the Arduino IDE. And the third is going to be the firmware that we're going to flash onto the Mega. I'm going to leave a link to this page explaining all the stuff that I'm going to go over now. But I'm going to head down to the releases link here. Then I'm going to scroll all the way down to the assets. And under assets, I'm going to download the latest version, whatever that happens to be. For me, that happens to be 10.2 underscore portable. Go ahead and extract that zip file that we just downloaded. And the first thing we want to do is run this CH341 drivers. There's an executable somewhere, setup.exe. These are going to be USB drivers to get the Mega to talk to our computer. OK, next we can go into this other folder, this Arduino IDE portable, and launch arduino.exe. Now I'm going to plug my Arduino into the micro USB port here. Then I need to go to File sketchbook and select cart reader. Then I need to go to tools, board, and select mega or mega 2560. It was already selected for mine. Then we need to change port to whatever port shows up in this list here. For me, that's COM4. Now we need to scroll down a little bit until we get to this section that says choose hardware version. And we are using hardware 5. So let's go ahead and uncomment out the line that says define HW5. If you scroll down a little bit more, you'll see a section that says enable modules. I'm just going to leave all that stuff alone for now. This is where you can enable or disable different cartridge types that you want to be able to read and write with the cart reader. However, I think it adds more and more memory to the Arduino. So you don't, I don't think you can just enable all of them by default. So I'm just going to leave it with the defaults. And if I have to, I can always change it later. But if you're following along with me and you don't have that clock gen board, you have to come in here and comment out the line that says clock gen installed under hardware five. Okay, finally, we go to sketch and upload. Okay, it took a couple of minutes, but now the firmware is flashed to our mega and it even verified that the flash was successful. While we're here, we might as well prepare the SD card as well. So I'm going to use the recommended SD card formatter tool here. I'm just going to do quick format. It's going to erase everything on the SD card, but that's okay. All right, so now the SD card is formatted. Now we need to copy all of the files that are in the SD card folder that was in that zip file that we opened earlier. We'll copy everything from this SD card folder into the root of our SD card. It also says that we should hide all these files in Windows so that they don't clutter up the cart reader's file browser screen. So just select all the files and right click and go to properties and then check the hidden check here and hit apply and then we can hit okay. Now we actually need to modify this Mega 2560 Pro. There is a fuse in the middle of this bundle of three surface mount components down here. This piece in the middle, we need to desolder that just with a normal soldering iron. This is going to allow the cartridge reader to be able to switch the Arduino back and forth between five volts or three volts, depending on which cartridge we're trying to read from. Okay, this is pretty simple. All we really need to do is add some fresh solder on both sides of the component. And then with solder on both ends, we can do a trick, basically go back and forth between both sides of the component, heating up both of those ends. And then we should be able to relatively easily take that right off the board like that. Now we can take one half of our DuPont cable, just kind of cut it off. And we're going to need to strip and tin it and solder it onto one of those pads of the fuse that we just removed. We're going to add some solder to the left pad where the fuse just was. I'm going to add a little bit of liquid flux and we could solder the wire onto that pad. All right, that looks pretty good. I'm just going to clean it up quickly with some IPA. We also need to install all of the male pin headers that came with it. You'll need to solder them all so that they're facing up like this. Should be able to get all of them on there at the same time, or at least these two long ones first. Now we can tack these pin headers down. Just make sure that they're lined up on the other side. They look pretty good. While we're here, I'm going to add this other little set of pin headers that I didn't add yet. And now we should be able to solder everything.
Okay, that's all of the pin headers installed on the Arduino Mega. We do need to solder the other side of that DuPont wire to this hole down here on the actual main PCB. So let's do the same thing. Let's cut the wire and then we will strip and tin it. Put it through the hole like this. Should it be enough sticking out on this side? I may have to hold it from underneath and go like this with some solder on my iron already. Maybe add some liquid flux. Well, I ended up cutting my half here too short and the other half broke off of the Arduino. So I may just swap out this DuPont cable just for some nice silicone wire. I think that'll be a little bit more sturdy in the long run. Now we can place the Mega onto the pin headers. Just like that. We also need to solder the pin headers onto the clock generator board. There's no other modifications we need to do to the clock generator board, so that can also go in its pin header. Before we can test everything, we do need to solder a jumper on the back of the MKS Mini. There are two little pads on the back side here that we need to bridge with solder. This will allow the three volts generated by the MKS Mini to be used by the rest of the cart reader. In order to test the cartridge reader, we're gonna to have to put our SD card in here. Then we need to connect both of our IDC cables. The inside cable here is going to go to the inside plug on our main PCB. And the outside cable is going to go to the outside plug on the main cable. Okay, let's put the screen on this side. I need to turn this bottom power switch to off and the voltage selection here to five volts, which is up. And I can connect a micro USB cable to the Arduino. Let's see what happens when we turn the power switch on. Ooh, fancy. So we're greeted with a menu that we can scroll through, which is pretty cool. This is a good sign, so let's turn it off again. Let's plug in a Game Boy Advance game turn it back on. Let's see if we can dump this Game Boy Advance game. So let's click Game Boy. It does say Game Boy Advance 3 volts here and I'm using a Game Boy Advance game. So maybe we turn it off again, set the voltage to 3 volts instead of 5 volts and then turn it back on again. Now let's go back to Game Boy. We'll select Game Boy Advance 3 volts. See what happens when we click the button. Interesting, look at that. So it labeled our game, because this is Pokemon Leaf Green. Gave it the ROM size and the save file name, I guess. Rotate to change, press to select. Okay, so it detected the right game, so let's push the knob in, and it will press the button again. So let's go ahead and read the ROM in. Oh, we have a flashing indicator on our LED. I'm just gonna leave this for a second, see how long it takes. Okay, I'm not really sure how long that actually took. I'll put it on the screen here, but let's press the button again. While we're here, let's read the save file too. Oh, that's it, that was a lot quicker than reading the ROM off the cart. I'd say that's a good sign and we can move forward, so let's turn everything off and we can unplug everything. Put the screen aside for now. With the main PCB finally assembled and tested, we can move on to the cartridge slot PCB. So let's put the main PCB aside for a second. It's important that we keep track of which side of this cartridge PCB that we're looking at. The top side or the top that should be facing up when we're all done is the side that has all of the consoles labeled on it. The bottom side has a bunch of the pins labeled on here, and this is the side that's gonna be facing down. And there's a specific order that we wanna solder everything, so I'm gonna place the top side facing up here first. Then I need to find which of the cartridge slots that I've got here is the Super Nintendo one. I think it's this one that looks like it has three different sections here. Then I'll place that in the SNES slash SFC section. I'm gonna flip this over. As you can see, I've also switched to my knife edge tip. This is just going to make soldering all of these pins a lot faster. But we should still start by soldering just one of these pins first. And making sure that it's level. And I think we'll solder a pin on the opposite corner as well. Now we should be able to do some drag soldering. This is not very easy because the pins here are pretty tall and it's hard to get the solder in there.
All right, with the Super Nintendo slot installed there, let's go ahead and solder in the 1K ohm resistor. Take our resistor and just kind of fold it like that. Put it in the slot here. Fold this side like we did before. Should be able to solder this okay with the knife edge tip. With the 1K ohm resistor installed on the same side as the 1K resistor, we need to solder some more of our female pin header. There's a section labeled SNES CIC here and it's like eight pins long, I think right here. So we're going to take our female pin header, basically do the same thing we did before. Take out a pin, cut our pin header. Let's solder this pin header here. Like I said, it's on the same side as the resistor that we soldered, so it faces kind of down. Then we should be able to pretty easily drag solder from the top. Okay, maybe not pretty easily, semi-easily. While we're here, I'm just going to clean the flux out of the Super Nintendo controller port spot here. Next, we need to take this long 20 millimeter tall male pin header, and that is gonna go above and below the Super Nintendo cartridge slot part. So right above the female pin header that we just soldered in and below where we soldered the Super Nintendo slot on the top. And again, these pins are gonna be too long, so we need to take, what, three off of this one? Two? So just take our side cutters and cut off the pins we don't need. Then we should be able to just put the pins in here and solder them on the other side. And now we can drag solder it. And now we do the same thing on the bottom here. All right, there are our 20 millimeter male headers. Now we just need to solder the other five cartridge slots on the top here. I'm not gonna include this section because I think you've seen me drag solder enough things on this build. So we'll come back in a minute when I'm all done with this soldering. Before I do that, I actually wanted to point something out here. You can see at the very bottom here below the master system on my PCB specifically, it looks like the solder mask has come up from this trace here. I really don't like that. And I think there's probably a pretty good risk that the pins that are right next to that exposed trace might short to that trace. So I have this silicone conformal coating pen that I'm just going to paint over the exposed traces there. So that's pretty much it. I'm just going to let that dry and hopefully that will protect it a little bit from shorting those vias there. And another thing I wanted to note is the N64 and the master system, they look extremely similar, but the pin pitches are different. So be careful when you're putting some of the cartridge slots in. If it doesn't go in right away, then chances are it's probably not in the right spot. All right, well, it took a while, but all of the cartridge slots are now soldered into that board. There was flux kind of everywhere, but I did my best to clean it up with some isopropyl alcohol. So we have a semi-clean, slightly sticky cartridge slot PCB. However, we still have to populate the SNES CIC that is supposed to go on these female headers here. Now we only need a couple of components for this CIC board, the PIC microcontroller, the ceramic capacitor that we talked about earlier, and some more male pin headers. Now, fortunately for me, the PIC microcontroller already came flash from my friend who sent me this kit, but unfortunately for you, that means I'm not gonna show how to flash it in this video. I will, however, leave a link to how you can program this yourself, or there's actually a lot of surfaces on the internet where you can specify the microcontroller that you want and give them the firmware file and they will flash it for you. So once you have the microcontroller flashed, we need to kind of flatten some of the legs a little bit. So I'm just gonna bend them against my table just so that they are a little bit more straight up and down. Now we could take the SNES CIC board, then we can line the little half moon thing on the microcontroller here, put the half moon here on the board. I know it's a little bit confusing, but this little symbol right here is the moon indicator. So we're going to face the moon part toward the inside of the board, and then we can solder it. Yep, 
If you're curious why there's two different footprints for picks, the designer of the Sandy Cart Reader put both footprints here just in case you couldn't get the smaller footprint. You could always order the larger one here instead and still be able to use the same board. All right, now let's do the capacitor. These capacitors are not polarized at all, so we can just put them into the board here. Thread the legs again like we did earlier and solder it in. And now we need some more of these shorter male pin headers and solder them in the top row here. That's all for soldering the SNES CIC board. It will go into these female headers on the bottom of the cartridge slot board. There is one more quick step we need to do before we can assemble the cart reader, and that is to solder on our N64 controller extension cable. Now this cable is for reading memory cards from N64 controllers. We're gonna have to cut the male end, I guess this is the male end because it has the pins here. We're gonna have to cut the male end off and solder it to some pads here by this 1K ohm resistor. We need to decide how long we need to cut this cable. And like I said, it solders here onto the cartridge slot board underneath, but its final resting place is going to be somewhere here on the actual 3D printed stand thing. I think I want mine to stick out the side here and I can always zip tie it to the front here just for some strain relief. But the spot we're gonna need to solder here is by the resistor, which is going to end up being on the right side somewhere over here when the whole thing is assembled. So I think this is good, if not too much. So let's cut it off. Okay, so now the unfortunate thing is you can't necessarily trust the colors of the wires here because each manufacturer that manufactures these controller extensions, they may use different colors and they don't always stick to the same color code. In fact, the colors in my cable are different than the colors in the Sandy cartridge reader assembly instructions. So we're going to have to do a little bit of extra work and use a multimeter to find out which pins here in the end here correspond to which wires in this end that we cut off. So in preparation for that, I can use these smaller wires wire strippers to expose the ends. And if we really wanted to get ahead, we can actually pre-tin them. I will put a pin out of this on the screen, but if you're looking directly at the female end of this cable, the order is going to be 3.3 volts, data, and ground. So that kind of corresponds to these points on the board that we're gonna to solder to. So we have VCC on the right here, which is 3.3 volts, data or DAT, and then ground on the left. So with our multimeter in continuity mode, let's see if we can find which of these cables is the three volts. Put one end of the multimeter into the first pin here, and then we'll try to buzz out which one is the three volts. It's not black, not red. Oh, I think it's the red one. In my case, red is three volts. Let's find out which wire is the data pin. I'm gonna guess white. Let's find out. Yep, that was right. That means his last pin, which is ground, should be black. Yep, I was right. The instructions say that we should not solder these wires through these vias or else they could break off. So it mentions just to use these as normal solder pads. So we're gonna fill them up with solder. So VCC is 3.3 volts, then ground, and the middle data is actually one of the legs of the resistor. So let's add some more solder to that. Then we can rearrange our wires here. So they're gonna go in red, white, black order. Add some liquid flux to the data. Let's do the data one first, and then we can solder it on. We can always come back and touch this up after, but let's just get all the wires on first. Okay, let's do VCC, or three volts now. Gonna hold the wire down with our tweezers and solder it on. And last is the ground, or black for me. All right, I'm just gonna clean these up a little bit. It's gonna be a little bit difficult.
Okay, I think that looks pretty good. So that should be everything for the soldering. So let's go ahead and put this aside. If you haven't noticed, I dumped out the bag of hardware. It's finally time to start assembling our cart reader. The first thing we should do is embed these threaded brass standoff things. We're going to be actually melting them into the 3D printed plastic here in the front to hold the LCD screen. So we're going to need a soldering iron with a very pointy tip. So I'm gonna very carefully put the threaded insert over the end of my soldering iron that's turned on and then I'm going to try to push it into the center of this hole I'd say that worked kind of okay one down three to go okay with these out of the way now we can move on to actually screwing down our main PCB thing. Now there are four holes on each side of the PCB that line up with the frame thing, except for this left side is a little bit confusing because there's like five holes here. I'm pretty sure that what we need to do is actually use this inside hole and it's gonna go through the Arduino here. But first things first, let's just do one of these to sort of secure everything in place. But what we're gonna do is line up the holes on the main PCB with one of the holes on our frame and put a screw up through the bottom here. And then we want to put one of our washers down and then take one of these standoffs and screw it down. You want to make sure not to tighten this too tight yet because you might have to move the board on the left side here. Now let's try to get this screw in here. I think it might be a little bit difficult to get the washer in. Oh, nope, looks like I got it. Let's do our insert. I think this is correct because this other hole that's here, I can't really screw through this part of the Arduino. So I think this is the way you have to do it. All right, now we can put these screws in all of the holes. Just for the heck of it, let's connect the screen too. So the inside one here is going to go to the inside one on the screen like this. And the outside one here is going to go to the outside one over here on the screen. Actually, I don't know if we can put this screen on yet because the N64 controller connector has to come out here. So maybe let's put this over here. Like this and we need to figure out a way to screw this in. First, let's put the pin headers here on both sides. Make sure everything is lined up on the inside here on both rows. We may need to back it out a little bit actually to get the washers in. And now we can try to get these screws in on this side. I'm not going to screw them all the way down just yet. Okay, before I screw everything together, I'm gonna give it one last push down so everything is tight. Actually, before I screw it all together, I just wanna give it a test to make sure that there are no shorts in the slot board. So let's plug our micro USB in again. Switch it to five volts here, and let's turn it on. Hey, it looks all right. All right, seems good. 
Now I know these cables are kind of long, but I'm just gonna leave them like this for right now and I can do some cable management later. But you also wanna make sure that the N64 controller cable is coming through here first, otherwise it's gonna be too thick to fit through that gap. All right, let's try to screw one of our screws in here to our threaded insert. Okay, so I got lazy and I just shoved all the cables in here for now. There is one more finishing touch and that is to add these little sticky feet onto the bottom. And a Sandy cartridge reader was born. Now that we have a fully assembled cartridge reader, let's go ahead and test it out. Now I realized that the game that I took the save file from earlier, this Pokemon Leaf Green, it actually doesn't have a save file battery. I was trying to test whether or not we could rewrite a save file after replacing the battery, which should wipe the save file out, but I won't be able to do that with this game. I do, however, have this Pokemon Crystal version, but unfortunately there's no save game on this either because I think the battery is dead. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna replace the battery in this game, create a new save game, and then re-disconnect this battery to try to erase it and then save the file back with the Sandy cartridge reader. So let's put this aside. Let's take our game bit and open the game up. All right, here is our save game battery. Let's go ahead and add a little bit of new solder onto these battery tabs. Now we should be able to lift this old battery off. and we can clean off the old solder. And now for our new battery, we wanna make sure that the battery orientation is the same way. So it looks like the positive side is the leg that is sort of flat to the board, and the negative side is the part that has like a tab that sticks up off the board. So that seems to be the same for these replacement batteries that I have. The positive side is the flat tab, and the part off the board should be the negative side. So that means this negative side should line up with the negative pad on the board. Let's add some solder to that negative side. a little bit of liquid flux. Let's connect the battery. And then we can solder the positive side. I'm just gonna add a little bit more solder to the negative side. Okay, so the battery's replaced, which means that I should be able to save a new game onto this cartridge. I'm gonna go make a new save with this cartridge and then we can dump it using the Santa cartridge reader. Okay, so I have a game on this cartridge now, so let's go ahead and turn it off. Let's grab the cart reader, plug it in, plug our game into the Game Boy slot. I think we wanna be on five volts, so I'm gonna put it to five volts, which is up, and then let's turn it on. Let's go to Game Boy, Game Boy Color. Okay, that's the ROM. Let's go to Read Save. Okay, looks like that was all that it needed. Now let's disconnect the battery again, see if that wipes the save file. Then we can reconnect the save battery. Let's see if that deleted our save file. Okay, that's really strange. The save game is still on there, so I wonder if we have to leave the battery disconnected for longer. I really wanna delete this file by removing the battery, so let's try it again. This time, let's completely disconnect this battery. Okay, the battery is disconnected. I'm just gonna leave it like this for a little bit, and then I'm gonna come back, and I'm gonna put the battery in. Or actually, what happens if I put the cartridge in without the battery in it? We did it! Save file deleted! Okay, now let's reinstall that battery. All right, now we can reassemble it with the battery in. Let's put the cart back into the cart reader. Now let's go through Game Boy, Game Boy Color, and right save. All right, now let's check if that save is back on the cart. No, why? I think I may have figured out the issue, but I'm not positive. So it may have been an issue with the SD card that I was using. I swapped it out for a different SD card. This is a newer Samsung Evo. So just to prove that I'm not BSing you, I'm gonna do it all again. So there is a save file on this cartridge now. 
I'm going to reread the save file. Okay, now we should have it saved on here. Now we can re-disconnect the battery, uh, this poor cartridge. Now let's turn the game on without the battery in it. I found that that's the quickest way to delete the file. Okay, now we don't have a save file on this cartridge anymore. Now we'll reconnect the battery. With the battery installed, let's go ahead and rewrite the save file. As you can see, the more save files that you write, it just kind of appends it to the end here. All right, now fingers crossed that we should have the save file back on the cartridge. We did it! We did it! Well, I hope you learned something from this video about how to assemble the Sandy Cartridge Reader version 5. And I hope you learned that you can read ROM files and read and write save files to many different games. If you enjoy open source projects like this, then check out this video where I put together an open source Game Boy Advance consoleizer. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.